Vision Church, we are happy you are joining us today, that you are in the house with us. If you're joining us online because you can't be here in person, we're happy you're joining in with us as well. And as always, feel free to comment. If you got prayer requests, you can comment them in there and we can all be praying for you. Or uh, if it's more private, you can message the church page and our team can be praying for you as well. And if you have any questions about salvation or anything, you can always do that uh, by uh, the online connect card or messaging us on Facebook. Uh, so we just want to pray. We want to welcome the Spirit of the Lord into this place. So let's go ahead and do that. Father, we thank you that your presence is already here. And we welcome you in, God. We invite you in, God, that we want you to be here, that we know you have full authority to go anywhere you want, but we want you to know that we want you here. That our desire in coming to this place and gathering together is to seek your face and to hear from you and to worship you and bring glory to your name. And so God, I pray for every heart listening right now that is burdened or tired, or just struggling. Maybe they can't even put words to how they're feeling. God, that I pray right now that your spirit, the Holy Spirit would pour down over them and they would feel your peace and your comfort and your joy. 
that they would feel relief from whatever is that, that, that burden that is on them. So God, we come to you right now and we surrender to you and we lay down all of our burden, all of our guilt, all of our shame. We repent of our sin because we want to worship you freely with open hands. We don't want anything hindering us from coming to you. And so God, we give it to you now. Father, we thank you for Jesus. He's the reason we are here. He's the reason we're alive. And so God, we want to worship him today. This is all for him. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And I searched the world But it couldn't fill me A man's empty praise and treasures that fade Are never enough Then you came along And put me back together and every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Come on, church, lift this up. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. And you still call me friend Amen Cause the God of the mountain Is the God of the valley And there's not a place Your mercy and grace Won't find me again
and adore you God God in this season um, that we remember that you sent your son God to live this human life God and in his birth he was sent later to his death his death on a cross for us God so we praise your name forever the name above every other name the only name we cling to the only name that truly matters the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, so God, I pray in this season of distractions that, God, we come with a spirit of adoration and thanksgiving to your throne, God, that despite our circumstances, that despite what valley or mountaintop we might be on, God, that you deserve our praise forever and ever. So, God, we pour out all of our praise to your feet, God. All of our worries, all of our anxieties, all the messy parts of us, we pour out at your feet as an offering, God, because you deserve it all, of the glory, God, for delivering us from our mess, from calling out of the darkness into your marvelous light. God, we praise you for it all, for the things that hurt as we were refined by fire. God, we praise you for that too. God, we praise you for spiritual growth even when it's uncomfortable. God, you are good and you are moving and you are working and you are faithful. God, we praise you for the people in this room that they aren't here by accident but God they have been called to this small unit of your family God to encourage one another to sharpen one another God to point us back to you so God I praise you that we can sing of one accord one voice for one name Emmanuel God I thank you that you are with us here in this place right now so God this service is yours Every word we speak, every word we sing, every action, God, it's yours. So God, would your spirit move in a mighty way, in the way that only you do, change, transform, convict, speak, 
God, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Merry Christmas, church. I'm excited I get to say that to you, so Merry Christmas. If you would, go ahead and turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. Luke is found in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke. And so Luke chapter 2 in your Bibles. Hope you have your Bible with you. If you don't, uh, grab one of those paperback ones somewhere in, the, in a chair in front of you. Um, and if you don't own a Bible, you can take that one so that you can have a Bible to read when you're at home. Uh, we were supposed to have two baptisms today. I don't. I think. I don't think they made it to church today. So if they come in late, we'll figure that out. If not, uh, we'll be planning another baptism service in a couple of weeks. And so if that's something that you've thought about, you feel like God's kind of been laying on your heart, working through you. Uh, if you want to talk to us about that, we'd love to get that. The more, the merrier. Uh, it's amazing what God's doing. That we've got to have so many baptisms uh, uh, this year, and so we're thankful for that. Uh, we're in our series called "Don't Miss." Christmas, and I asked this last week, so I'm going to say it again. I think sometimes it confirms things for us when we say it out loud, so say it with me. Don't miss Christmas. And I want this to be a reminder that, one, Christmas is on a Sunday this year, and I know that is, it's funny that Christmas is, uh, around Christmas time is the most uh, church attendance, one of those times of the year that most people go to church. Uh, you know what's one of the least attended Sundays of the year? When Christmas lands on a Sunday, which is just really weird. Um, uh, I know many of you are going to be out of town, and you just can't be here, or you're going to have a new baby. Like, like we got a couple people that's going to have a new baby, and if you can't make it, I understand that. But if you're going to be home and you're not doing anything, um, make a chance, make make plans. Uh, start inviting people. Make plans to be going and picking people up and bringing them to church. It's going to be awesome. Uh, I mean, we said to have the kids come in the PJs if they want to. We're going to have a gift for the kids. Uh, I believe the kids are going to be maybe even singing a song, and so it's going to be awesome. And so we want you to be here. Um, and so I, I want this to be a reminder for us. This is a busy time of the year, right? So don't, don't get lost in it, because some of us, that's already happening, and maybe even before Thanksgiving, you were already starting to get lost in the mix and the hustle and bustle and everything going on, so don't get lost in it. Enjoy this time. It's a special time of the year. It's also a time where many people are grieving, and I understand that, but find that enjoyment. Gather around the people you love. Spend that time together, but also, most importantly, focus on Christ. I promise if you make this holiday season about presents or parties or food, you will end up missing Christmas. But if you want this to be one of the best Christmases you've ever had, focus on what really matters. Focus on Christ, and then spend that time with family focusing on Jesus uh, in, in this series, we are looking at different people in the story of Jesus' birth, the, the, ma the real Christmas story, and, and these people either almost or they did miss Christmas. Because of the choices they made, something's going on in their life, they missed out on seeing Jesus born. Last week, we talked about Joseph, which is Jesus' earthly father, the, the stepdad, if you want to call that, the one that raised him and provided for him. Uh, Joseph chose the hard thing, and he didn't miss Jesus. You get that? He had every right or every uh, way out to run away, divorce Mary, get out, and, and he took that time, and he chose the hard thing, and he pondered, and he considered these things, and God spoke to him and said, this is of God. Joseph, you're a part of this plan, and he was obedient to what God said, even though it was hard, even though it disrupted and messed up his life, and it was very scary for him, he still trusted God, and he chose the hard thing, and he didn't miss Jesus. Often when we're choosing the easy things in life, that's when we miss Christ. That's when we miss Jesus in our lives. Many of us are so busy checking our boxes off, Right, checks in our boxes off of life. You know, I did this, woke up, went to, went to work, got this done, got to go get the groceries, got to go do these things, got to take the kids over here. We're so busy checking our boxes off saying, okay, we did what we were supposed to do, that we miss what God is doing, what God is wanting to do. For a Christian, you should wake up every single day and take a moment, thank God that you're alive, and say, God, how do you want to use me today? 
What do you want to do in my life today? Many of us, we jump up and say, what do I want to do today? What, what am I going to do? What is my list today when we should be surrendering to God and saying, God, what is your list for me today? What do you want, want to do in me today? I've said this before, but I just want to reiterate this, that as Christians, Jesus isn't just a part of your life. That's not what it is, and I think Americans, for the most part, and there's many other people around the world that call themselves Christians or they're churchgoers, and Jesus is just a part of their life. Listen, as Christians, Jesus isn't just a part of your life. He is your life. Like, He is the reason you're alive, and so the reason we exist and live is for the glory of Jesus Christ and to make sure other people know Him. And many of us, man, we're so busy and we're running around and we're, and we're do, focusing on what we want to do that we're missing out on what God wants to do. That we say, okay, Jesus is my Sunday friend, but Monday through Saturday is about me. And that's not the way Christianity is designed by God to work. It's that Jesus is the center of your life and your universe. And yeah, you might have other things going around it, but Jesus is in the center of that. He's not one of the other things that, that, that rotates around your life. He is your life. And with that in mind, let's look at Luke 2. We're going to see Luke's account of Jesus' birth. We're going to read 1 through 7. It says, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph... It's our guy from last week. Also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room, there was no place for them in the inn. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that for this season that we get to put extra focus on the birth of Jesus and study it and know it. And it brings so much joy and comfort to us, God, to know what you did to send your only son into this world, to come into this dark, messed up world, to live and die for us. Thank you, God, that you did that. So God, I pray right now that you would convict us that when we've been serving our own purposes, when we've been just caught up in the busyness of life and we were just... We're tired and, and, and we're busy and, and things are crazy, God, that we've missed out on what you are doing, that we've missed Christ in our lives. The opportunities we've missed to share the gospel with others and to love on others and to see miracles and to see you move because we were selfish. So God, convict us of that today. Open our eyes to where we have disobeyed you. Open our eyes to where we've missed those opportunities, where we've missed out on Christ. But God, also remind us by the power of the Holy Spirit that there are more opportunities. There are opportunities today and tomorrow and the next day to, to say yes and to be obedient to serve your purposes. Give us boldness, God, to live for you despite what our world looks like. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, so here's what I want to do. I want us to see God's hand, and I love this with, with, with Scripture in general, whether in, we're in Genesis or we're in Revelation. I want us to see God's hand writing this story, weaving this story together, that God has prophecies in the Old Testament, and the things happen in New Testament that make those prophecies happen. And it's like, is that a coincidence? No, it's God. And I love the way we see that it just confirms that God is outside of time. It also confirms that if your story doesn't look good right now in your life, that the story's not over. Right, And so that God's still weaving a story together. Learn from what you've done. Learn from your mistakes. Repent of that. Serve God and watch him turn your life around. And so I want us to see God's hand weaving through this story. There's a prophecy that says that the Messiah is to be born in Bethlehem. Old Testament prophecy that the Messiah will come from this little podunk town, Bethlehem. But, but Mary and Joseph are from Nazareth. That's not Bethlehem. So, so you see that we got a problem right now. Is that, that Mary's going to have the Messiah and Joseph, they're from Nazareth, but, but that's not going to fulfill the prophecy if he's born in Nazareth. He's supposed to be born in Bethlehem. Oh no, what do we do? And if we were part of this plan, we'd be pulling together the Holy Spirit and Jesus and God, and we'd say, okay, something's, we got to figure this out. But God wasn't worried about it. Because you know what it tells us is that all of a sudden, 
Caesar Augustus is like, hey, Joseph, you got to now travel to Bethlehem to be registered for a census. Caesar Augustus sends out this decree for a census. Each person had to go to their town of their lineage to register. Joseph is of the line of David, fulfilling another prophecy of God. God's hand weaving through the story. And Bethlehem is the city of David. And get this, it is where David was raised and anointed king. So the Messiah, the true king, the eternal king, Jesus, would be born in the town where King David was anointed king. See, I want us to see this picture coming together because it's really awesome. And if you miss this, it, it takes a lot of the wonder out of it that God's weaving this story together. The true king would be born where David was anointed. And then we read this famous verse in verse 7. It says, she laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. So, so I want us to get this. The king, the eternal king, king that will reign forevermore the savior of the world the messiah the one we've been waiting on comes into the world and it says there's no place for him like like we should be rolling out the red carpet we should be emptying our homes we should be inviting him in the messiah is coming there's a place for you here come save us we're lost we need you it says they go to the inn, and the innkeeper says, there's no room here. There's no place for you. There's a barn over there, but there's no place in here for you. And this brings us to our character for today, the innkeeper. It's very interesting because the innkeeper is not really mentioned in Scripture. It just says there was no place for them in the inn. Well, what we know is that probably there had to be somebody, could have been a woman, most likely a man, and from that I'm going to refer to he, just to make it easier for me. He was uh, somebody, some guy, told them the bad news, that there's no room. We're all booked up. There's no vacancy. There's nowhere to go. There's no place for you here. Side note, the innkeeper is like the least sought-after role in the Christmas pageant, Right? <laughs> Like, I'll even take being a sheep, man. Like, like I don't, I don't, I, like, because if a sheep actually gets to be in the final moment, right? Like, I'm in the manger, I'm chilling back there, getting to see the whole thing. The innkeeper just shows up, is like, nope, and then shuts the door, right? Uh, anybody been the innkeeper in a pageant at some point? I thought David had been the innkeeper in a pageant at one point. I thought so. Um, so we have this, this, this moment here that we don't see necessarily in Scripture, but at some point, someone told him, there's no room for you here. You, you got to turn you away. And so, to get the whole picture, let's look at back at the first couple of verses here. It tells us, in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each of his own town, each to his own town. Now, I want to get this, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. So that's a lot of people showing up to this tiny town. Like if your great, 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 great grandpa was from Bethlehem, all of a sudden you got to go there. Imagine the amount of people that had, their families had moved away and they'd went to Nazareth and they went to other places. But all of a sudden you got to all go back to this smaller town to register. It's going to be insane. And so what I want to do for us today is to apply this to our lives. And I want to look at some warning signs that you are on the path to missing Christmas. When you're going to miss out on Christ in your life, you might miss the whole point of Christmas. When you're going to miss what God is wanting to do in your life, these are the warning signs that maybe you can write down or you can put on a post-it note to remind you that when life is like this, take a breath, maybe pray, and ask God to work and put your mind on Jesus. And so the first one is this, if you're taking notes, is this life is busy. These are warning signs that you might miss Christmas is when your life is busy. Now, here's the thing. A lot of times you can't help that, right? Sometimes the life is just busy. Well, what are you going to do about it, right? But this is a warning sign. This is like the light on your dash that says, hey, you're busy. Something's gonna, there's something could go wrong, right? Like you need to maybe get this checked out. You maybe need to take a moment and flip up the hood and see what's going on. When your life is busy, that is when the enemy is coming to attack you and distract you and kill you and destroy you. That's what he does. To distract you away. And so the busyness, what, and here's another thing we got to note. In our world, busyness is sometimes, a no, it seems like a noble thing, right? 
Oh, they're so busy, and they work so hard, and they're so busy. And we, we put working hard, a good work ethic, with busyness, and we all of a sudden think it wears a badge of honor, like, I'm so busy. Well, busyness isn't necessarily a good thing, because it usually means we're filling our lives full of things that shouldn't be there. So the scene set up for here uh, that we just read in the first three verses looks a lot like the Christmas season. I, I imagine that Mary and Joseph are trying to navigate through this town, and there's tons of people pulling carts, and there's kids running around, and they're trying to get registered, and they're trying to find a place to stay, and they're trying to find food. It, it, it's like an opening scene of a Christmas movie where they're at the mall, and they're like, where did you know, Lucy go? And okay, we got to go get that, and we got to get food, and okay, where's Uncle so-and-so? Okay, get everybody here. Are we going to be late for this? You know, it, it's this bustling moment where everybody's in this town trying to figure out what they're supposed to do. Busy. It's, it's people trying to get what they need to visit family, to find a place to stay, to find food, to get everything done that they can so then they can go back home. And, I, and what I want us to note here is that I, I don't want to make the innkeeper here out to be a villain because I don't think he is. I don't think he's a bad guy, right? Because he's not a villain. He's not a bad guy. He's just doing his job. He's just trying to manage the craziness that is his life. He is just busy. It, like behind Mary and Joseph as he's turning them away, he's got a long list of other people he's got to tell, turn away as well. That it's just crazy for him. And, and business is really good for him, right? Like this is like what he's been waiting for. Is like he thought he was going to have to close up shop and then all of a sudden, you know, thousands of people come into town and he, he, he's doing really good, but he's just trying to manage what's been handed to him. He's just very busy. Now, the innkeeper probably had no clue the importance the baby in Mary's belly held. And you probably didn't really know, okay, that's the Messiah. Maybe they didn't, they probably didn't, Joseph probably didn't have a moment to be like, now listen, I know it's full. That's the Messiah. Hook me up, right? Like, I, I doubt that probably happened. And if Joseph did do that, it probably just encouraged him to kick him out even more. Like, we don't want any crazy people in here, right? The innkeeper is just trying to survive this season of busyness. Can anyone relate to that? I, I'm just trying to make it through it i'm just trying to make it special for my kids just trying to make sure all my family's happy and everybody gets to be seen and everybody gets to see the kids and everybody gets time i'm just trying to work hard so i can get that bonus so i can afford this christmas right now here's the thing when we're busy if we aren't careful we might get everything done we want to do and never stop to ask god what he wants to do that, that is a big problem for us, that when we are busy, that's a huge warning sign that you are going to miss out on what God is doing, that you need to get rid of some stuff in your life to make room for God. With all that being said, I want to make this clear that it was God's design for Jesus to be born in a stable. That wasn't, the innkeeper did not mess up God's plan. In fact, I think that's exactly the way it was designed because the whole other sermon here is that Jesus being born in a barn around livestock is the most humble way to come into earth to share, share, I'm here for all people. That he wasn't born into a palace and he wasn't, that he was unapproachable and he was just this, this prince and this king that just was raised separate. No, he was born poor in a barn approachable that even shepherds that were a long way off could come visit him like the king of the universe was born and shepherds get to come talk to him so him being born in a barn it wasn't messing up god's plan i believe that was god's plan from the start but by the innkeeper not making room for jesus he missed out on seeing the savior of the world be born he missed out on that he missed out on that moment because he was busy. Not a bad guy, just busy. And I think that's many of us. We're not bad people. We want to serve God. We want to love God. We want to be used for Him, but we're so busy that we just don't have time, right? We just, I, I just can't deal with that right now. I just, I'll deal with it later. That leads us right in the next part. Look at verse 4 here. It says, When Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. 
second warning sign that you could miss out on what God wants to do in your life is this, when your life is complicated. Once again, could be your fault that your life is complicated because you've made a lot of dumb decisions. Could also just be that we live in a fallen world and things have just happened and fallen, the chips have fallen where they may, right? And your life is complicated. I'm sure Joseph didn't plan. We talked about this last week. I'm sure Joseph didn't plan to be stuck in this little Bethlehem town with a wife who's about to pop and and no place to stay. I'm sure that wasn't a part of his plan. I'm sure he was freaking out a little bit. It was a little complicated for him. If we look at the innkeeper, the innkeeper is in a complicated situation because there's no room. It's, It's hectic. And now he has to turn away a pregnant woman. That's complicated. Say, once again, we don't know who this guy was. Maybe he was a horrible man, but for the most part, let's just give him the benefit of the doubt. He's a good guy and his heart's breaking, but what is he supposed to do? He's in a complicated, impossible situation. I can't just start kicking people out to put you in there. When life is complicated, that is when we often miss out on what God is doing. One, just because it's hectic. And two, because we're so distracted by those things that we're not turning to God to let God sort out what is complicated. We, we tend to start thinking, well, this is too complicated for God. Maybe that's been you. Your life's been all in a, in a knot and messed up, and you can't figure out any way out, so you just start to assume that God can't fix it. So you just stop uh, consulting God, you stop talking to God, and you start just trying to figure out and, and handle it. Like I said, some of us have complicated lives because of bad choices. Others of us, it's just the hand you were dealt. But we got to know that when life is complicated, we are more distracted. But I believe it is times like this when it is most complicated that God is usually working the most. Now I want you to hear me say that when it, life is most complicated and you feel like you can't see God because you're so distracted and you're so busy and you're, it's hectic, it's usually when God is working under and around and above and He is working the most. So don't miss Christ. Don't miss what God is doing in your life because it's complicated. Life's complicated. I hear people say all the time, I I just don't have time to go to church. My life is just too crazy right now. Well, from a biblical perspective, if your life's crazy, church is probably where you're supposed to be, right? But but our minds, our human minds, and, and the enemy spreads these lies to us. says, if your life is complicated, if your life is crazy, if your life is busy, you don't have time for this. You don't have time to just stop and pray. You don't have time to help that person. You don't have time to be generous. You don't have time to go to church. You don't have time to read your Bible. you got to figure this out. And that pressure weighs on you, and those lies are just pounding in your ears. The whole time, God is wanting to work, and, he, and He's moving around your story, and He's wanting you to surrender to Him so He can have His way in your life. It is when life is busy and complicated that you need to trust God the most. Don't miss what God is doing. It's in those seasons, man. If you talk to people that have walked with Jesus for a while, they will tell you it's through the hardest seasons, it's through the busiest seasons, it's through the most complicated seasons that their intimacy with God grew the most when they gave it to Him. God, I don't know how to get through it through this. It's yours. God, I, I, this is, I'm too busy. Well, well I'm going to just start putting some stuff to the side and I'm just going to live for Jesus. I, I don't need some of these things in my life. Don't miss what God is doing in your life just because it's complicated. Look at Scripture. We talked about this last week. Every person that Jesus used in Scripture to do amazing things, every person that God wanted to use in the Old Testament had very complicated, messed up lives. They weren't perfect, and they had family issues, and they had money issues, and they, 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 they weren't very good at speaking. Whatever it was, they had issues. They were complicated. They were busy, but they surrendered themselves to God, and God did amazing things. Maybe that's you. You're, you feel like you're too messed up. You feel like you're too busy. Just stop. Give all that to God and surrender your life to Him. Look at the next couple verses here. Verse 6. It says, and while they were there, this is our main verse, 
And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, in a feeding trough, because there was no place for them in the inn. Once again, let's paint this picture. The king of the universe comes into the world and he gets laid in a feeding trough. So nobody else wanted to surrender up any room for him. Listen, when life is busy and complicated, it usually means, this is our third warning, that life is crowded. Life is too crowded. When your life is complicated and it's busy, that usually means that your life is too crowded. I want to say it again. There was no room. There was no place for them in the inn. When the Savior of the world came to earth, there wasn't room for him. Many people, I just, I just don't have time for God right now. Listen, then you need to clear out some junk in your life and make room. He is the king of kings. He is the savior of the world. If you're a Christian, he died for your sins. You better be making room for Jesus in your life. I just, I just, I just, don't, have, I just don't have time for that. And I know God loves me and I know he's forgiving, so I'm going to do my own thing. Yeah, that's true. He's full of grace and mercy, but you are missing out on what God wants to do. You're missing Christmas. You're missing Christ in your life because your life is too crowded. So what's our life too crowded of? With, with the wrong people? Probably. Life's a little too crowded with the wrong people. Maybe it's too crowded with the wrong things. Maybe you're crowding it full of junk that, you, that God says, hey, I don't want that in your life. And here's the thing. Even good things can become bad things when they're put before God. Even good things in your life, a relationship in your life that's good, it's not toxic, it's good and everything. But if it's distracting you from God, it's bad. It's crowding your life and taking up room where Jesus wants to be. The assumption with this story is that the innkeeper, feeling bad, did let them stay in the stable. Some people think it was a cave or it was a, just another room attached to the house where all the, the animals were. Uh, it, it's a nice gesture, right? Like it, he's tr- Maybe he's trying here. Like He's trying to help out. I mean, it's better than being on the streets. But the thing I want to focus on is that he still didn't invite them inside. You can stay out there. There's no room in here. I'm going to apply this to us. How many of us tend to do the same thing with Jesus? Jesus, I don't have room in my life right now uh, for you, but you, you can stay outside. There's this, there's this stable in the back of my life that I very rarely go to and I don't really care about, but I want to know where you are. Jesus, hang out out here and because there's no room in my life right now for you, and I'll come get you when I want you. Shame on us. We say, there's no room for you here, but you, but you can hang out out here. You, you can stay outside. You, you can have this part of my life, but not all of my life. You can't really come in, but you can still be in the vicinity of my life. Well, that's not truly being a Christian, because a Christian is Christ indwelling you, is the Spirit of God living in you, that you are now the temple of God, that the Spirit of God lives in, not lives in the barn out back lives in you and works in you. Maybe that's us. You, you, you can have this part of my life. You can have my Sundays, but, but not the rest of my week. You can have this part of my life. You can have my mornings where I'm drinking my coffee and I'm going to read you know, a devotional, which is wonderful, but I'm just going to do that, but then I'm going to go on about my life and not think about you anymore. You can have those parts of my life, but God, Jesus, you can't have it all. You can't come in, but you can stay out there. You treat him like a genie. I want you to stay here where you are, and when I need you, I'll come get you. Many of us, we pack him away like Christmas decorations. We just bring him out once once a year when we want to enjoy him. Go get the Christmas decorations. Blow the dust off. Haul them upstairs. Haul them out of the shed. Get them down from the attic and put them up. Oh, it's beautiful. Season's over. Throw them back, right? Like, whoop. And many of us do that. (laughs) Hold on now. We're getting excited. (laughs) Life is too crowded with so much junk. So if your life's busy, if your life's complicated, it's because it's too crowded. Clear out the junk in your life. Clear out some people in your life. You better make room for Jesus in your life. 
I'll close with this. I, I heard this story. I don't know if it's true, but as I was researching, I heard this story about a kid's Christmas pageant. And there was a little boy that had been coming to church, hadn't been raised in church, didn't really know all about it. He was just a young, young boy, and he was getting excited about being in this pageant. Well, he gets the role of the innkeeper. And he, he's excited about it. He doesn't know what that role means. He's just excited to be a part of something. So he gets the role as the innkeeper. His line, sorry, there's no room in the inn, and shut the door. Now, that's all he has to do. Well, the day came for the Christmas pageant, and everybody's there, and parents are there, and it gets a moment for his line, and Joseph knocks on the door. He opens the door. Mary and Joseph are there, and they say, hey, can, can we stay here? And he blanks out. What's my line again? He's just so excited, he just forgets his line. And, and, and the adult director of the show is on the side of the stage going, there's no room in the inn. And he's like, what? And he's just sitting there pausing, lights are on him, he doesn't know what to do. There's no room in the inn. And he's like, oh, oh. But he looks down and it says that he saw Mary and Joseph and she's pregnant and said, this is awful. Not knowing the story, not knowing what he's necessarily supposed to say, the boy says, hey, I guess there's no room in the inn, but you can have my room. Once again, don't know if that's true, but it is beautiful that a little boy that's innocent, and that's why I love kids, is because they say, I know what I'm supposed to do, but I don't want to do that. I know there's no room, but you can have my room. Come on in. And so Mary and Joseph are just like, okay. So they just walked in the door. I don't know if they just restarted the play or what they did after that, but they just walked in, and then the director's like, you had one job, kid. But, but man, what if that, like, come on, what if that is us? Jesus, man, this world says there's no room for you, but you can have my room. You can have my life. Our world wants to push you out of every single place it possibly can. They're not going to push you out of my heart. They're not going to push you out of my life, that I'm going to hold on to you, that I'm going to invite you in, that every single morning when I wake up, I'm going to surrender my plans to you, say, God, what do you want to do in my life? Have your way in my life. Welcome the Savior of the world into my life. You can have my room. You can have my life. You can have my talents. You can have my gifts. You can have my money. You can have my family. You can have me. There is room for you in this place. This is what following Christ is about. Take my life. Take my room. It is all for you. Man, isn't that beautiful? Once again, I don't know the innkeeper situation, but what I would have loved to have seen, and it would have been a beautiful thing that what we would want to do if we're the innkeeper would be say, listen, all the rooms are booked up. There's one room left. It's my room. I'll sleep in the barn. You come on in. In fact, you make it your own. I'll clear all my junk out. I'll clear anything out you want. Make it yours. You can live here. That is what we have to do as Christians. When we come to Jesus, we don't say, hey, listen, you can have this corner in my room. You can have this one room in my house. You can have the basement. You can have the shed. No, we say, it, my life is yours. Clear out all the junk you want and make it yours. I've said this before, but when the Holy Spirit indwells a believer, He wants to renovate. When you move into a house, you don't keep the previous people's house stuff in there. You make it yours. That's what God wants to do when he indwells believers, is he wants to renovate and make you his. Life is busy. Life is complicated. Life is crowded. Well, listen, we're just going to be full of excuses if we keep going. We just stop and we say, Jesus, I'm going to make room for you. Even if it hurts, if i got to remove this person in my life, I really don't want to do that. But if I need to make room for you, bye. That I know I really love this thing in my life. I love this job. I love this stuff. I love these things. I love this addiction that I have or this, this sin in my life that I have. And I want to hold on to it tight. But I know that you want to make room in my life. You want to work in my life. You want to live in my life. So I'm going to clear this junk out to make room for you. We look at the modern church, I don't want to be too judgmental here, but I feel like you can judge them by the fruits that they bear, right? We look at the modern church, and that's we, we just look like pretenders. We don't look like people indwelled by the Spirit of God using for eternal purposes and to advance God's kingdom. We just look like, like fillers, space fillers that just come into church and we just leave and we do our lives. No, we need to clear out everything and make room and say, God, I am yours. You are the center. You are the foundation of my life. Use me. Everything I have is yours. That is the way we come to Jesus. 
So we're going to pray and we're going to worship some more. But I encourage you, let this be the moment. If you're feeling that conviction, embrace it. It's good. Because you can leave here not the same as you came in. You can leave her clearing some of that junk out. Give it to God. Maybe it's one of those things that you can't let go of and you're just holding a grip tight onto. You need to pray, God, give me strength to let go of these things and let you have way in my life and do what you want. And that's where revival happens is just a bunch of people saying, God, I'm yours. Not, not the most talented, the most best speakers, the most knowledgeable, all the degrees, not all that. It's just, God, I'm yours. That's what we see in Scripture like, there's some fishermen over there that don't know how to read. I'm going to use them, right? That, that's, that's the way God works. So let's come before God now. Give him all of our junk and say, use me, I'm yours. Start clearing things out. Let God have space in your life. Don't turn him away. Don't put him in the back shed. Say, you can have my life. Let's pray. Father, that is our prayer today. God, that we make room for you. God, that we clear out all of this junk in our life that is distracting us from you. That our lives are too crowded with things that don't really matter. God, we've been so selfish. We've been so self-centered. But not anymore. God, we seek you now. We want to be like this kid in this pageant. There might not be room in this world, but you can have my room. You can have my life. God, I'm yours. Take me, use me, mold me. God, I pray that the people here that are struggling with some sin in their life, they're feeling that conviction, God, that you would just bring the Holy Spirit to bring peace to them. Set them free of that, whatever the sin struggle that they have is. Make them new right now. Set them on your path. Help them clear out their life of the busyness and the complications and, and, and the crowdedness, God. And if there are people here that have never fully given their life to you, maybe they've been just keeping you on the outside. They just kind of know where you are. But for the first time, they want to invite you into their life. They want to know you and have an intimate relationship with you and walk with you and serve you and love you, God. I pray right now would be the moment that they would just cry out to you in their own words, Yes, Jesus, I need you. can't do this on my own. I need you. I need a savior. I need someone to save me from my sin. Jesus, save me. God, continue to move in this place as we continue to pray and we worship. We give this time to you. Work. Have your way. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Here is 
where I lay it down Every lie and every doubt This is my surrender Oh, I will make room for you To do whatever you want to Just do whatever you want Thank you for your word this morning and for this story. God, I pray that, um, God, if we felt the, the heaviness of conviction, that, God, we welcomed it because we want to look more like you, more like your son. God, I pray that we were made aware that our eyes were opened to what's crowding our lives. That we break the habit of busyness sometimes we can't help there's outside things but God we are made aware to remove the things that no longer belong in our life and God help us give us the strength to follow through and to do that because God you want to work and God we want to be a part of it God your will and your way and the good plan that you have for our lives and for the world God it'll be accomplished no matter what but God we want to be an active part of it not just bystanders not people that just stand in the background and watch but God we want to be used by you so God we empty ourselves and we surrender all that we are and all that we have to you my God, we would heed your calling and the privilege it is to have the gospel in our hearts and to carry the torch of it to broken and lost people that need you, God. God, we see brokenness and hurt everywhere we look, God, and you are the only thing that can mend and to heal that. So God, I pray that we believe it, that God, our heart breaks for what breaks yours for those who do not know you. So God, would we be bold as we profess our faith in the gospel through this Christmas season that it has always been about you, Jesus. And that starts with us, our church, our families, the way we speak about you, the way that we make an effort to make room for you, therefore to glorify you. So God, we thank you for this church family. And God, we can remind each other what this has really always been about. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The church, it's been 
an awesome Sunday being here and worshiping with you. Um, as you know, we had baptisms last week and we have more coming up. If that's something you have questions about, um, if you've accepted Christ as your Savior and you want to follow through in baptism or you just want to know what that looks like or what that means, we'd love to talk to you. Um, we always have an online connect card. It's in the link of the bio of the live stream and it's always on our website too. Or just grab someone here and that looks like they've been here a while. They look comfortable in this room and I know that they would love to talk to you about Jesus, about baptism, about what that means. If you call Vision Church your home and you want to worship through giving, we have the box out in the foyer as we always do and we have text to give. Um, you can give on the Church Center app, whatever that looks like for you. And a few things we want to make sure you know, we, I think Nathan mentioned it earlier, but we have several expecting mothers and two of them expecting any day now. Um, so if you've brought diapers for the diaper drive for them, we just want to say thank you. Um, that's just a small way that we can bless them as they prepare to welcome little ones in this busy season. Um, but continue to bring them because we have another person that's expecting in the early spring. Um, so we're just like, super excited to love on them like that. And again, thank you if you've done that. I also want to say thank you to those of you who have volunteered um, to ring the bell for Salvation Army at our local Walmart. Thank you for doing that, being a smiling face um, for a good cause, and we really appreciate that. We need more people to volunteer to be a part of that. I think the shifts are only a half hour, which you're more than welcome to take more than that. But if you'd like to do that just yourself or with your family or a couple friends, um, please, I think there might be a sign-up sheet up front or just get in contact with one of us at the church or Jane, and we would love to get you plugged in doing that. That'd be this Saturday at our local Walmart to ring the bell for the Salvation Army. Vision Students is tonight. This is my last thing, I promise, but not here at the church. It'll be at Nathan and I's house. It's our Christmas party. Um, so if you have a 7th through high school age student, 7th grade through high school age student, um, have them contact us. We'll get them the address. It should be fun hot cocoa bar games, all that good stuff. And we're really looking forward to that. So again, church, it is our honor to be here with you, especially in this season. And we'll see you next week.